financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And, um, oh, that's the old acquisition. I, I, I forgot that you've actually dissolved New Bronstein Times, spun that off into Bronstein Solutions, and then rebuilt your company to uh, Bronstein Enterprises. I'm I sorry. I I fell back into the old Bronstein corporate structure. And my apologies. Actually, it's now we go by Bronstein Sports Plus BSP. Oh, okay. Bronstein Sports Plus uh, founder Jonah Bronstein joining us as he always does. Uh, Jonah, it's been uh, interesting covering both the Bills and Sabres, uh, which I have been doing since Matthew Fairburn's wife had a baby last week. Congratulations to the Fairburns. Uh, I have been since uh, substituting on the Sabres beat for Matthew, and it has been fascinating uh, to be around both teams at the same time. And there are some parallels uh, going on uh, with teams that entered this season with expectations, high expectations, have not met them. And now we have a situation where both teams are now in a situation where the players are rallying around the head coach uh, for different reasons. A couple of weeks ago, Tyler Dunn uh, from the Go Long website uh, wrote a three-part series about Sean McDermott. Uh, highly critical of the head coach and past misdeeds, uh, criticism of coaching decisions, of how he handles uh, the office, uh, communication, uh, aloofness, uh, lack of accountability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Tyler Dunn really got uh, granular on all the different uh, blemishes within uh, one bill's drive that can be attributed to Sean McDermott and the players uh, responded to that uh, with a couple of victories, uh, one at Arrowhead stadium over the Kansas city chiefs in which afterward the players were vocal about that series and said that it did bring them together. And then one week later at home, the bills uh, destroy the Dallas Cowboys really impressive win their most complete win of the season. And, oh, by the way, against one of the best teams in the NFL. Meanwhile, with the Sabres, a yo-yo of a season, blowout losses to bad teams, blowout wins against good teams. And uh, Tuesday night in a 9-4 loss to the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, one of those bottom dwellers, Fans in the third period started chanting, fire Donnie, fire Donnie. The players heard that, and according to them in the dressing room last night after drumming the Toronto Maple Leafs, scoring nine goals, first team in 40 years to give up nine and then score nine, uh, the Buffalo Sabres say they're doing it for Donnie because they thought it was ridiculous to have to hear those chants in their home arena that Donnie's a good man. And now you have both teams in Buffalo galvanized by criticism of their head coach. I'll just uh, open it up there. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Joan, on where these teams are? 
Well, I do think it's interesting as you illustrated the parallels in kind of the narrative structure with these two teams and how um, it appeared to be crisis mode and for the Bills seems to have moved on and used that as inspiration to, as you say, rally around coach Sean McDermott and save their season. The Sabres is really just one win, but it was a very uh, demonstrative feel good win against one of the better teams in the Eastern conference and their rival, a team that they don't always play well against at home with a partisan crowd and a difficult, um, you know, that situation with the, with the split crowd often. However, I see it a little bit different. I think the Bills, in the way that they rallied around Sean McDermott and the things that they said, they seem to perceive the the article that was written as an attack on Sean's character and felt the need to stick up for Sean as a person and as a leader and as a man, as a coach, and his character that was called into question and different examples that maybe have shed poorly on Sean McDermott's personality and coaching style. With Don Granado, uh, the Sabres players have always, I think, um, you know, been fond of him and fond of the person that he is and wanted to defend his character. And it was, But it was a little bit more of we have to play well in order to reflect back on the coach and prevent this situation from getting to a point where maybe, you know, NHL get, coaches get fired all the time. I think there's been four coaching changes in the league recently already, and there will probably be more before the season ends. And Don Granado, if the Sabres had gone into a tailspin loss, you know, a number of games, a 10-game losing streak, or maybe not even gotten that far, um, he probably would have been on the hot seat and a coaching change might have uh, happened. And that you would have definitely heard more and more calling of it from fans. It's a very quick response that fans are going to point to whenever a team is struggling. But they play well. It reminds me more of what didn't happen with Ken Dorsey. And I think a lot of the things that you're hearing from the Sabres players about, you know, it's not the coach's fault we played poorly. It's on us as players to play better and do this for the coach's sake are the things the Bills had said about Ken Dorsey. Now, as it turns out, that coaching change, that coordinator change probably did, was necessary and did help the Bills uh, play better and get out of their own little tailspin. Um, And with the Sabres, it's looking like, you know, there won't be that type of change or there won't be an assistant that gets sacrificed to get the Sabres to play a different style of hockey. But the rhetoric around it reminds me a lot of what we were hearing when uh, Ken Dorsey's job was being called into question a month ago. Yeah, interesting to see the Sabres with what I think with a different team you would call statement wins. But when you take a look at the totality of their season, these statement wins, using finger quotes, mean nothing. They, Or at least they have meant nothing. In the past month, the Sabres have racked up wins over the Maple Leafs, of course, last night, the Golden Knights on the road. Uh, the Bruins and the Rangers, uh, four big victories by a combined score, by the way, of 22 to eight. So these aren't particularly close games. The Sabres have handled some of the best teams in the National Hockey League. And the games heading into those four, the four previous games, they had lost by a combined score of 26 to 10. Uh, and then, of course, they go on and lose the next game. I don't have the uh, the aggregate score of of what happens afterwards because the Sabres never win two in a row. Well, I don't want to say never. They did win two games in a row once all season, and you have to go back to, uh, I think the dates were October 29, November 1st. Um, so an incredibly aggravating, frustrating season. I heard from Jeff Glore last night, who just can't believe what he's seeing. Uh, I also heard from him on Tuesday night while that massacre was uh, underway. Um, I, can you think of anything like this, Jonah? I, I can't uh, in any sport that I've ever covered. I've covered really bad Sabres teams. I covered the bankrupt seasons. Um, I covered two of the best seasons in Sabres history. Uh, a lot of the bill seasons I've covered, I mean, just the up and down aspect of it. I mean, does it, how unusual does this feel to you? Well, I mean, the nine goals, the giving up nine goals, one game and then scoring nine goals right. the next night hasn't happened in 40 years in the NHL. And even a team scoring eight goals and giving up, giving up eight goals in the game, scoring eight goals in the following game. The last time that happened was 2005, the Toronto Maple Leafs. So that, it is an extreme aberration, the inconsistency that the Sabres played with this week. 
as far as game to game, not always playing their best. I don't know how rare that is. I think that that's somewhat to be expected from the youngest team in the NHL and, you know, the youth and the injuries that the Sabres have had. And I think people covering the team and a lot of the fans maybe have come to expect that inconsistency. I think it was said a little bit sarcastically, but coming out of that Columbus game, there was a lot of hand wringing and talk about whether a coaching change needed to be made or would be made or who would be, you know, whose head would be on a stake to kind of symbolize that that loss was unacceptable. But a lot of people that have been following this team closely sense that, you know, they're going to come out and play really well and probably be. I said that night, I said, Tuesday night down right outside the locker rooms and the media, the media room before getting back into the elevator and heading back up to the press box. I said, I, my prediction was, I think the Sabres are going to win Thursday night, seven to three. I was, it was, that was the score for a little while. Um, of, I was, I mean, you don't really know when you make a prediction, I'm not big in the prediction game. I was somewhat tongue in cheek, but it was coming from a place of, you know, that's just what I felt. That's just what, that, what this team has been. And I, I want to go back to Tuesday night because some people have um, reflected on it. I've re, I've had a lot of people reach out to me regarding the column that I wrote after Tuesday's game in which I made note of only six people, uh, six players being in the Sabres dressing room after a game. And that maybe I am a little out of touch because I haven't covered the National Hockey League on a full-time basis uh, since 2007. Um, and a lot of folks were taking it to mean that I was complaining that there weren't more players in there for me to interview or to get quotes from. And that wasn't the point at all. I know that players are available if you make a request but I've also been around teams, very good teams, in which a big part of the accountability, which is a word that has been used a lot in trying to describe what's wrong with the Sabres. They defend that they do have accountability. Fans look at it and say, where's the accountability? The media asks, how do you define a credibility, uh, uh, accountability? Um, and um, it's this loose vibe. It's this loose concept of accountability. What does it mean? Is Don Gregor... Don Granado ever going to bench Eric Johnson? You know, of course he has, uh, he did last week after the, uh, debacle in Colorado. Uh, but is uh, Don Granado going to take away ice time from X? Is he going to elevate Y? Is he, you know, all these different things about accountability. Well, one of the ways to be accountable, at least back when I covered the, the league and I've covered some pretty impressive captains, Michael Pekka, Stu Barnes, Chris Drury, and, and Daniel Briere, um, is that after a particularly putrid loss, and I think Tuesday night would qualify, some people were calling it the rock bottom of at least the Granado era and maybe even among the worst losses in Sabres history, especially when you consider that the Blue Jackets suck and they were without Boone Jenner their best player, and they were using a backup goaltender, um, that there would be people parked at their stalls because that is something that captains have done in the past, the leadership group, and say, the media is about to come in here and Kyle Oposo is going to have to eat a shit burger. And everybody has to be willing to take a bite. Now, the, re the reporter might not come up to your stall and ask you for a question, but we want you there. Now, I'm saying that has turned out, I've learned, is is an old school thing because players just don't hang around in the dressing room to talk to the media anywhere. I will say, though, there were a hell of a lot more players in that locker room on Thursday after scoring nine goals than there were in giving up nine. There were a lot of players in that locker room last night that were willing to be spoken to that weren't in the locker room on Tuesday night. Um, but my point being is you talk about character and the – definition you've heard the saying character is what you do when nobody's looking i think you can also say character is something you do when nobody makes you do it and so the response being well just go to sabers pr and put in the request for whomever and we'll bring that person out um i would like to have seen some players in that dressing room willing to at least have a bite of that shit burger 
Uh, and, and if you don't get approached by a member of the media, fine, then head back to the, the back room. Uh, but I, I thought it would have been nice to see. Uh, and again, um, it's not about me asking the questions. I was more observing that there was nobody in here willing to provide answers. And there's a, there's a subtle, but significant difference there. Yeah, I think you made a astute and fair observation about how a locker room in the NHL is different than it was when you covered the team 15 years ago, however many years ago it was, and not even that long ago. But having covered the Sabres pretty regularly over the past five or six, seven seasons, um, different eras, different coaches, different leadership groups on the team, but also some pandemic seasons where the locker rooms weren't open and interviews were all done on Zoom or there was a period of time when Players were coming to the podium, but we weren't going into the locker rooms. You don't see a crowded locker room after a win or a loss very often. Um, you see it more after practices and morning skates, more players kind of hanging out at their stall. And if you want to talk to them, you can. If you don't, they're just there. Um, you know, you say there were more players in the locker room last night. I didn't sense that there were many more. There were still only kind of the usual suspects that were either waiting to talk or would be expected to talk. And it didn't seem like the celebration well, uh, and, the or maybe, okay, there, there were, well, I, I should have counted. I didn't, but I will say when you walked into the dressing room on Tuesday night, the only players were on the left-hand side, which is where the goaltenders and the forwards sit defensemen more on the right-hand side of the locker room. And that was empty on a night in which nine goals were given up. There were no defensemen in that dressing room. Uh, there was a request put in for Rasmus Dahlin. We didn't speak to him. It was kind of maybe a timing issue because Kyle Oposo spoke for so long as the only one left a after a while in the dressing room because the, the other handful of guys who were there when the door opened had by that time got left. They departed. So Kyle Oposo standing there like he's supposed to as the captain, answering whatever questions. Uh, by the time that was done, the locker room was empty. PR went back into the back room, brought Tage Thompson out. So he was the second person we we spoke with. Rasmus Dahlin was requested by that point. Don Granado is to is supposed to go to the to the lectern. And we ended up waiting quite a while for him. Uh, but um, yeah, there were defensemen in the dressing room last night that weren't on Tuesday. Um and I think that, you know, those were the guys who needed to, uh, I'd like to see, or I'd like to think, and maybe I wouldn't, maybe I'd be a big, a big pussy. I don't know, but I would like to think that there should be at least a couple of guys on the team that on a particularly bad night would say, you know what, I'm going to sit here because it's not comfortable. And even though we are used to, we've gotten into this, uh, uh, the routine now is that Hey, if nobody's put in a special request for us with five minutes to go in the third period, which is what a lot of teams do after the game, they didn't do that back when I covered hockey. It was the locker room was open and everybody was available. And then if that person was, and let's say there'd be 12 or 14 guys uh, and you could quickly get somebody unless they were hurt. Um, so it's a little different. You didn't have to, you didn't have to even think about putting in a, a request with the PR staff, but that is the norm. Now that's not even a Sabres thing that's across the NHL. Um, but that's not the way it used to be. And that's not the way it is in other sports. Um, you know, especially the national football league after a game, it's, you pretty much have everybody and they'll say, okay, these people are going to the podium pretty much every, and those are the people you don't talk to because they're going to the podium. Uh, and then everybody else is there. Uh, and the NFL is, uh, has been pretty vigilant in, in, in making that happen. Uh, and to the point where players getting fined uh, for not being available. Now, again, I'm rambling now, but this wasn't a PR observation. This it was a, I would like to see some of the players say, I'm going to sit in here because, because it was a bad game. And I just want to make us make it, you know, it, make myself available just because not, not, not out of force or not because I was requested I'm here and I know I had a shit game. I was a minus four 
uh, and I'm going to sit here. And if after five minutes, nobody's come up and tried to talk to me, then I'm, then I'll go. And, but at least I was here. And that's one of those accountability things that was always huge in hockey when I was covering it. And I'm not a dinosaur. I mean, I was covering it. You know, well, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I am a dinosaur because the players I covered are now general managers in the league. Um, although Eric Johnson was playing, uh, Kyle Oposo was playing, uh, when I was, uh, st when I was, uh, towards the end, they've seen this situation. I even asked, uh, in the, in the athletic direct message, the corporate direct message that we do, I asked our NHL channel, I said, what, what's the procedure? What's it like around the league? And most situations are like the Sabres. You request two or three players, you get them. Um, some teams maybe will give, go up to four or five, like the, the Maple Leafs will do more because there's a huge more, there's a much larger media contingent. There's it's the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, other teams might just bring out two or three guys. Some let you in the locker room, some bring them out, out into the hallway. Um, but those days um, are kind of over. The, the, the most recent everybody sit here in the stall and take your medicine, face the music uh, example that one of our writers could come up with was 2015. Uh, Jonathan Taves doing it with the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, but then again, these examples that I'm bringing up are, are these are great leaders doing it. Jonathan Taves, Chris Drury, Michael Pekka. I mean, I asked, I asked Scotty Bowman after the game, Hey, am I too old school to think about this? And he, or to think of this. And his response was today's player just doesn't do it. The, the only thing that you can do that a coach can do because players have way more power than they've, they, they've ever had is to take away ice time. And so I reached out to another uh, NHL executive who used to be a captain and he pretty much said the same thing. Those players are tough to find anymore. So anyway, it was just more, an observation than a critic than a criticism. I, I just think that had there been that version of accountability, I would have been impressed. I was I was left disappointed. It would have been an aberration to see that. It almost would have been odd to see every player sitting at their stall. And Wouldn't it have been have, striking though? Wouldn't it, would it have, have been, been striking? And it would have been obvious that somebody would have said, "Hey, you know, this is how we're going to carry this loss and respond to it." I think that athletes in general have changed in the way that they uh, represent themselves to the public, that if a player really felt like they had something to say, it might uh, come out on social media or hockey doesn't have as much of this as other sports, but on a player's own podcast or in their own control the message type way. Um, you know, you mentioned this. It's not unique to the Sabres. I, I cover the visiting locker room often for the Associated Press in past seasons and you walk in there and they got written on the board the number of the players that are going to talk. And there's probably visiting media that make that request, but it isn't really like you can go in there and get who you need all the time. It's players are chosen. And after a loss, it's usually the captain and some star players are put out there to be the spokesman for the team. And after a win, it's the stars of the game, whoever scored, sometimes the goalie. Um, but you don't have a lot of choices. It's kind of chosen for you before the locker room opens. And the Sabres, I think, are more media accessible than, than some of the visiting teams. Um, you know, I remember a game last year when Tampa Bay lost to the Sabres and Kucherov and Stamkos were benched in the second or third period and they were requested and not made available. So it, it happens league-wide where players aren't always available and, and star players aren't always there to be accountable or to, I think, sometimes the teams are protecting themselves, maybe from a player saying something in the media that they don't want them to say or they don't want to put them out there when they're angry um, I think with the Sabres they're a young team I don't think they have a lot of players that are at the points in their career and, and even their uh, Don Granado even mentioned this that some players aren't as good at verbalizing their thoughts or, or being in that position to speak immediately after a loss and speak for the team what I think and Dylan Cousins had just recently at least based on what we saw in in Mike Harrington's interview with Kevin Adams, maybe he got his wrist slapped for calling the team soft, which heaven forbid the guy speak out. I mean, that was the type of thing that I would uh, applaud if I were a teammate. Yeah, some of us do need a kick in the pants, but well, well, that, Kevin Adams hates that word soft. Um, but maybe also Kevin Adams is a little too biased about the team that he's assembled and and what it is or is not. Yeah, that, that's really what's missing. It's not 
who's talking and how many players are talking. It's what gets said. And if there's anything said, if there's any response that's satisfying to the fans and the questions that they have and the angst that's been driven by the inconsistency and the Sabres' bad losses at home, which is a trend that goes back into last season. And, you know, whether, you know, and I don't know if it's good for the Sabres if players are calling each other out publicly, but a little bit, a sense more of that, that if the Sabres play poorly, there are some accountability there are some repercussions i think it's okay for for what dylan cousins said because he didn't specify anyone he said as a team i mean it wasn't he wasn't uh, yeah i think you really get into a dicey situation when you start singling out a line or a certain group um but he was saying we're, we're making it too easy for these teams and i liked it and i think that i, I was I was disappointed to see that Kevin Adams didn't support him saying that. Hell yeah, I'd like more guys stepping up and saying we have to do better. Uh, and oh, heaven forbid you use the word soft. I guess that's a that's a that's like the the word quit in sports. Those are there are some profanities uh, in sports, and soft and quit are two of them. But. Um, yeah, for whatever reason. Uh, Dylan Cousins felt the need to say it, and uh, I I liked it. I liked that he spoke up. Uh, this is reminding me to cross back over to football. Speaking of accountability, uh, I ended up not writing about it because we went into the bye week, and we ended up talking about Sean McDermott and uh, – comparing uh, the 9-11 hijackers to uh, the the exemplars of communication. Uh, and that story took on a life of its own. Uh, but I talked with Tyler Bass after the Eagles loss. Now, he had a rough game, and he'd been um, sitting at his locker stall. Nobody was coming up to him. Uh, that was also a game in which uh, Jake Elliott kicked a 59-yarder uh, and in the rain, on grass, the whole thing. So the opposing kicker made a clutch um, a clutch play uh, to extend the game, send it into overtime. Tyler Bass also kicked the field goal in overtime to give the Bills the temporary lead. But, of course, it's not sudden death in the NFL anymore, and the Eagles had a chance to win and did with a touchdown. But um, – Tyler Bass uh, missed two field goals in that game. One was blocked. The other one went wide right, which is something that he's had a problem with, or um, he did at that point. He was having some wide right issues. And he could have, could not have been more chill after that game, talking about his misses, where he was mentally, Jake Elliott's successful conversion from far away, how he admired it. I was really impressed with Tyler Bass sitting there. He could have, he was, he, he could have gone to the bus. He could have been like, hell, I got to get the fuck out of here before these reporters come over and talk to me after they're done with Jordan Poyer and Leonard Floyd and whomever else. And he didn't, he was sitting right there in his stall with his luggage. I think he was waiting for uh, Reed Ferguson to, to get ready or to, to finish getting dressed so they could walk out together. And when I walked up to him, you never know what you're going to get with these interactions because the guy just had a bad day and his missed field goals were the difference. You don't have overtime if Tyler Bass makes his field goals. So um, he was, I wouldn't say he was happy to see me, but you would never have known that he missed two field goals in terms of, he was like, yeah, I got a couple minutes. Sure. What do you need? And I was, uh, anyways, so that's just my way of saying some guys are, are wired different. And, um, that was the type of loss with everything there with the victory well within reach. That was a type of loss that made it seem like the bill season might be over. So just wanted to bring that up. I thought it was impressive. Uh, Jonah, what would be uh, – let's also keep mashing up uh, Buffalo's uh, 
big league sports teams with the way the Sabres play against the great teams and against the weak teams. What would be your thought on the Bills losing to the Chargers on Sunday? Excuse me, on Saturday, on Saturday. I mean, it would be a disaster. It would be way worse than the Sabres losing to any bad team. I mean, just by the nature. Do you of think it's possible that the say that the Bills can lose to Easton Stick and the Chargers? I suppose anything's possible, especially with the short week and the travel, and the Chargers having a new head coach and maybe railing around that situation, and even railing around Easton Stick. And we've seen a few examples of this in the NFL this season, where a team was left for dead with their backup quarterback, and he came out and had you know a marvelous game, but. You know, the Chargers are a team that their season's over. They already made a coaching change. They're starting quarterbacks out. They're starting receiver, star receivers not playing. And, this, and the Bills need this win and are a team that has some momentum from the last couple of weeks. It would be an epic letdown to lose that game. Now, could it happen maybe with some missed field goals or punt return touchdowns or maybe momentum swinging type plays? I mean, it's the NFL and the parody at professional sports, I think. Anything like that could happen, but it would be the worst loss of all the bad losses in some of the inexplicable situations the Bills have put themselves in over the years. Uh, this would be one of the worst. It would definitely be worse, I think, than losing that home game against the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2004 and not making the playoffs, which would be kind of a similar situation in terms of letting a game get away. Um, I think it would be worse than that. The Bills have lost to two quarterbacks already who've lost their jobs this year. Uh, Zach Wilson, of course, got it back eventually, but they've also lost to Mac Jones. So Easton Stick doing enough to beat the Bills isn't uh, unforeseeable. However, I think that the Bills, you know, the idea of a trap game, which means you're looking to the next game, the Bills don't have a next game to look beyond. You know, they – they have to win every game. They don't even have a tough opponent next week. It's the Patriots. Maybe next week could be considered a trap game if the Bills take care of business. They're 12-point favorites last time I checked uh, at the Chargers. And then home against New England with the Dolphins in the regular season finale down in Miami Gardens. Now, that could be a trap game. But with well, the it, focus but, and all that – oh, go ahead, Jonah. Well, it could be a trap game. It could also be a game where the Bills are not favored and not the best team on the field. And not that they should lose, but that Miami is playing no, – I'm talking about the Patriots team. being a trap game. Oh, right? yeah. yeah okay. Because the, the big game. one is a week away. Right. Uh, and they're home again in, in, against the Patriots. But then again, the Patriots are a team that beat them. And anytime you can knock off Bill Belichick, I think that's – you have a tendency around these parts to get ready for the Patriots still. Um, or again, most teams, I think because there is still a, it's obviously mostly vanished, but there's still that mystique of the the hoodie on the other side of the, uh, of the field on the other sideline. And um, that has a team that not take anything for granted because they can get you. What's more likely to happen? The Sabres beat the Rangers or the Bills lose to the Chargers? The Sabres beating the Rangers. They've won there already, and even though it would require them to win two games in a row, which is a rare feat, you know, I think it's more likely they can go out there and, and play a good game and win that game than the Chargers beating the Bills with the roster and the injury situations going on. My question my, my, with the Bills would be more of, because I think we're all assuming they're going to win this game in the next game, is how well do they need to play? How many style points do they need to put on the board to feel none. good about their chances going forward? None. I think they are in pure survive and advance mentality. If they win by each of these next two games by a point, I don't think that shakes their confidence at all going into uh, the finale against the Dolphins. Um, you know, I think that uh, they'd be just as just as ready to go. Um, 
quickly on on the Sabers and the Rangers. Uh, my my take on it is I think the the Rangers probably handle them, uh, and my reason for that is twofold. Uh, number one, the Rangers lost to them also in Madison Square Garden the last time they played, so they're going to be ready. They're not going to be taking anything for granted, and also with the Sabers coming off a nine goal performance against the Maple Leafs, it's it's not like they're going to sneak up on anybody uh, in Manhattan uh, on Saturday night. How are you going to watch these games? They're both on at the same time, Jonah. Yeah, I haven't quite figured that out yet because also where I at home, I don't get MSG. So I always have to kind of make a move to watch a Sabres road game. But I do get Peacock, which is what the Bills game is on. So I haven't really decided the best place to try to watch both of those games. And I think with the Sabres, just to respond real quick on that, I think it's the opposite of, of what you said about the Bills. I think the Sabres do need style points even if they lose this game they have to get out of this rut where when they don't win they kind of get beaten off the ice and it just seems like they don't have much control over how the game goes and if it's a good game for them they they get going early and it's like it was last night against the Maple Leafs and if it's not they can't seem to wrestle control of a game in the second or third period or when they do it's too late and even even if they don't win maybe it's an overtime loss or a close loss just going there and playing another good game, playing their pace and, and the things that they want to do on the ice for two games in a row would be as encouraging, almost as encouraging as winning another game. Jonah, let's give the folks a spin around the big four basketball scene, if you would. Um, let's start with the men. Uh, can you just give a like a synopsis? I don't think we have to get into deep analysis, but I always like checking in with you. So that way I know how I'm supposed to feel about how the teams are hand are are playing relative to expectations heading into the season. You want the, the big four power rankings? That's usually how you frame them. Yeah, yeah. Let's get yeah, give me the power rankings, starting with number four and working up to number one. Uh, I'm gonna start with number one because I'm, I'm gonna go ah. somewhere with that. Um, <laughs> number one is St. Bonaventure from the start of the year. They've been considered one of the favorites in the Atlantic 10 or a top team in the Atlantic 10 and their non-conference performance has followed that. They have the best record. They beat Oklahoma. They lost to top 15 team Florida Atlantic last week, but lost by 10 and were competitive in that game. Uh, Binghamton and Akron still left on the schedule before a 10 play. They're the best local team. Canisius is the second best local team having beaten St. Bonaventure, having a six and five winning record, maybe being, being among the favorites to win the MAC and maybe being a team that can pull that off this season if they can get a little healthier and, and then stay healthy down the stretch. And then it's really neck and neck for the worst team in the Big Four. And you, you got to put Niagara three right now and Buffalo one, Buffalo four, I'm sorry. Uh, Buffalo's only won one game and it was against a Division two opponent. And they were a little bit more competitive and losing last night at Richmond, but they've been blown off the floor in a lot of games, a lot of first halves. Niagara's had some blowout losses, a loss to St. Bonaventure that was the worst in that series in 50-something years. But Niagara has a couple more wins. They played a somewhat competitive game last night at Syracuse. They've been a little bit better so far probably than Buffalo. But these two teams play each other on December 29th. And from some people I know watching local basketball, there's a lot of intrigue around that game. But the intrigue around that game isn't who's good. It's, it's who's bad, who's worse than the other team. And which one of these teams is going to be, you know, it could be maybe one of the worst big four matchups in history. If you really go back and look at two teams being bad at the same time, there's probably been another example of that. There were some lean years for UB at the, at the beginning of their division one ascendance when they first joined the Mac, but Niagara was very good at that time. Um, and, you know, Buffalo should win that game. They're at home. I think Buffalo's best players are better than the best players on the Niagara team. But the way things have been going and the coaching situation, uh, you know, Niagara, I don't know if they'll be favored in that game, but they may be favored in my mind to, to pull that game out. How far back do you have to go in the history of Bronstein Sports Plus or your various uh, other incarnations uh, to find Canisius ranked as high as second in your power rankings? I mean, relative to the other teams, I'd have to look back at different seasons, but they've been about this good. Reggie Witherspoon's first year, even the second year, they were one of the better teams in the MAC and, and had a good start to those seasons. Jim Barron had some good seasons when when his son Billy Barron was on the team, and then it slipped. I mean, Canisius has been 
at the level they are at. Before. But St. Bonaventure and UB have been pretty much locked into those top two spots for a long, long time, right? Yeah, that's true. And, and you know, UB was a winning team every year until finishing two games under 500 last year. But I'm trying to think about the year. Going back to when Billy Barron was playing at Canisius might have coincided with the last year Reggie Witherspoon was the coach at UB and they had a losing team. Bonham was probably good that year. I'm just, I can't think which years overlap. And yeah, Canisius, if we were to, you know, structure it over the past 20 years, they're probably fourth in that ranking, um, putting it all together. And Canisius being this much better than Niagara, I don't remember that happening too much recently. Um, and UB being as bad as they are and being the, you know, I guess they're not the absolute worst team of the big four because we just talked about how, you know, maybe they can beat Niagara and they're on the same level. But it's been a long time since UB was this bottom feeder team. And when that happened before, the early days of Reggie Witherspoon, you covered that. They were on probation. It was early in the Division One era. Um, they weren't even really – it didn't seem like they were even really a fully-fledged Division One basketball program. And for them to fall back to that level now, after making a coaching change that was supposed to maybe turn things around, uh, is disconcerting for UB fans. I think we'd have to see where it lined up. But when after the Jan Van Bredikoff, uh Bonnies, there may have been a time there where you would have Canisius and Niagara 1-2 in some way, shape, or form with uh, the Mike McDonald, Joe Mahalik days. Joe, Ma I mean, you'd have Niagara yeah. number one, and maybe Canisius might even be number two in that pecking order with St. Bonaventure totally uh, reduced to, to cinders and – um and UB still figuring it out. Yeah, you're talking 0407 when Anthony Solomon was the coach. Bonaventure was definitely the worst of the four Big Ten teams or uh, Big Four teams. They were going through their own, uh, you know, sanctions and things like that. Niagara was probably number one, the best team then. UB was good most of those seasons, and Canisius was. I think they had you know one solid season with Mike McDonald in that stretch, and then you know, fell off a little bit and eventually moved on from Mike McDonald and Tom Parada coming in as coach, and they very rarely won in his tenure. Uh, so I don't think there's been a time when, you know, in my time covering the Big Ten, I don't think Canisius has ever been the best of the Big Four. I don't know why I keep calling them the Big Ten. And if, But I don't know if they're the best right now. I still think even though they won that game at Bonaventure, I think that was, you know, they played well there every year. Reggie Witherspoon gets his team ready and prepared and kind of knows how to win that game. But I don't know if Canisius on a neutral floor against St. Bonaventure, if they were to play a seven-game series, I think St. Bonaventure is the better team. High school headlines before we wrap it up, Jonah? Well, when we get off this podcast, I'm heading over to St. Joe's where there's going to be a tribute and the announcement of a scholarship for uh, the St. Joe's basketball coach, Gabe Michael, who died last month. Uh, I guess a lot of deaths are unexpected, but this one was very much unexpected and surprising to people in the community. He is a Canisius High School graduate. This is St. Joe's versus Canisius, you know, maybe the oldest high school rivalry in Western New York and, and oftentimes one of the best basketball games of the season. And they're playing for the first time and will be uh, recognizing Coach Michael and uh, his contributions to local basketball. He coached at Williamsville South before St. Joe's and was an assistant under Mike McDonald at Madai before that, and a little bit of time at Canisius under Tom Parada. So that's a little bit of an event for Gabe Michael and the person he was and how much people in local basketball respect and appreciate and, and now are missing him, followed by, uh, you know, a an interesting basketball game against probably two of the five or six best teams in Western New York. And earlier this week, High school-wise, it was National Signing Day for the football players. I was out at St. Francis where Marcus Harrison, a offensive lineman for St. Francis who moved here from Iowa about six years ago, he signed with Georgia, part of Georgia's top-rated recruiting class and believed to be and probably is the first Western New York player to sign with an SEC school out of high school um, in history that anybody can think of. And, you know, that's a pretty impressive accomplishment for him and – you know, goes to show that if you're good enough and you're big enough and your arms are long enough and you have all the right attributes that, that you can get recruited to the top football programs out of Western New York. Although St. Francis plays a more challenging schedule than some other teams, but 
it, it does kind of show some people will say that the, the local players don't get enough exposure to get it recruited, but they can, they can, where was them. he ranked in the different recruiting services, different, you know, prep, you know, the best, whatever in the state of New York or the best the you know, at his position, do you know? I believe he was the top lineman in New York. I'd have to look it up to see his exact national ranking. He's a four-star prospect, a three-star prospect I'm looking at here, four-star in some places. Um, I don't know if he was number one ranked like some other people maybe have been, but he was somebody that like he's six, eight and a half, and he's got you know long arms, a seven-foot-two reach, and he's strong, and he throws the shot put, and he plays basketball. He has some agility, never letting a sack at St. Francis. And what he did was he went to Jim McNally's camp and – Dave Hack, another local person who had some NFL connections at that camp, and they saw him and they said, "Wow, this is a you know blue chip recruit," and started uh, you know passing his name along and getting some of the top recruiters involved. And when they came out and looked at him, everybody's recruited on their potential, and he has the size and the strength and the athletic ability to have that potential to be an SEC lineman for what was the two-time defending national champions. I mean, Georgia won't win it this year, but. When he committed over the summer, they were the number one team coming off two national championship seasons. Jonah, thanks for this. Um, and uh, thanks to, to everyone out there for your patience. Uh, we didn't have uh, episodes for a couple of weeks for a couple of different reasons, uh, but uh, here we are. We're not going anywhere. Um, thank you for listening and watching. Please uh, Favorite, like, retweet, subscribe, do all the different things that you can do to show your support uh, for Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK. And we will come back at you in a week uh, with a uh, review of how the Bills did against the Chargers, what the Sabres are up to or down to, and uh, various et cetera's and whatnots. Uh, everybody have a great Christmas. And uh, thanks once again for Tuning in to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations, and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.